thank you very much for this uh, introduction. I hope you can now see my um, my screen, my presentation. Yeah, I would also like to thank the Center for Austrian Studies and the Department for Linguistics for hosting this event. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to present some aspects of my research in this talk. Uh, here at the UFM, I'm affiliated with the Department of German, Nordic, Slavic and Dutch. But as um, Alice pointed out at my home university, I'm based at the Department for Translation Studies, which is in fact the field that I'm trained in, um, where I have my PhD in. Um, my research focus is on translation technology and its effects on, on human translation. And recently I've been dealing with the concept of translation and what happens to the process of translation when it's not a human, but um, actually a machine that, that translates. As a starting point, I wanted to show you these headlines. Uh, they're all from German language newspapers over the last couple of years. Um, machine translation has evolved technologically to such an extent that it is becoming a fierce competitor for human translators. And the press is also picking up on this development um, as these headlines reflect. Um, for example, the, uh, the Rheinische Post, for example, reported uh, that language barriers will soon be eliminated. It further says, studying foreign languages will soon be redundant. Machines will translate for us, they write. The Deutsche Welle wrote, translation, a duel between humans and machines. Um, it goes on, there are many pitfalls when studying a foreign language. Professional translators know how to handle them. Machine translation systems like DeepL are constantly available and, and unbeatably fast. Who does a better job, they ask. Um, the Tagesspiegel uh, reported on um, artificial intelligence um, replaces translators. Um, they say language professions at risk. They wrote competition is becoming fiercer in the language industry. In literary translation, humans still beat the machine, but not by a big margin. The Swiss uh, Tagesanzeiger reported on robots that translate federal regulations. They write, the federal government evaluates the use of deep L to translate official documents. This could save millions and make translators uh, lose their jobs. So these headlines showcase how much the media picks up on this battle between um, humans and machines in the field of translation. And they are not wrong. Um, so to underpin uh, the relevance that machine translation has today, I wanted to show you these figures. I recognize that there is not a wider context now to these numbers, but I wanted to illustrate how big that technology of machine translation has become and to what extent it is used. So these are figures from Google Translate actually. So Google Translate, um, so they said in 2016, they have 500 million users um, per day and uh, 1 billion words translated by Google per day. And then um, a couple of years later in 2019, in another blog entry, like this is how they communicate their success stories via the, the Google Translate blog. They said, we now translate 30 trillion sentences per year across 103 uh, languages. Of course, most of the translations by Google Translate do not have a very long lifespan. And many of them are probably just used for gisting, so just to get an idea of what a text is about. But these translations, they still count as the overall translation technology euphoria is also one by Microsoft AI and Research, where they claim to have achieved human parody on automatic Chinese to English news translation. So this paper from 2018 received a lot of attention in the machine translation community due to this very bold claim. Again, what's interesting here is what this actually insinuated. The author suggested um, that they have reached a point, uh, that they reached a point of human machine parody in translation. Microsoft's results were later reviewed uh, by computer linguists from the University of Zurich 
And they were able to demonstrate that Microsoft system scored significantly lower compared to translations by uh, human professionals when, when evaluating whole documents rather than isolated segments. Um, so uh, the authors of this study in this paper by Microsoft AI, they seem to have adjusted the evaluation method to achieve better, uh, better scores uh, for their MT system. Um, yeah, so I'd like now to continue um, with uh, uh, the academic discourse around translation technology. So the title of this book is Towards, uh, or the Future of Translation Technology Towards a, ro a World Without Babel. And this book is an example of how translation technology is currently um, displayed in the academic discourse. So translation technology has often been framed as an easy fix to language barriers. In this context, multilingualism is an impractical condition that's, um, and that's something that prevents different cultures from engaging with one another. Translation technology is presented as something fundamentally positive here to alleviate us from the deficiencies of multilingualism. It almost has, a, translation technology almost has a messianic um, uh, character. At the same time, they also blank out what human translation um, can actually do in the context of in, uh, intercultural communication. So, um, of course, machine translation is only one part of translation technology, but it's a central one and it has the potential to profoundly change translation as a field and a profession. So for those uh, of you who might not be familiar with machine translation as a technology, I've prepared this short overview of its historic development. Uh, Descartes and Leibniz mentioned the idea of mechanic dictionaries already in the 17th century. So the basic idea of MT has been around for quite some time, but the technology didn't exist, exist until the 1950s of the last century to carry out the first experiments, uh, which was when the first digital computers um, were developed. Back then, the systems were rule-based, which meant that uh, developers tried to teach computer systems how to translate by giving them rules, what to do in, uh, what to do in each case, uh, which is, of course, very time-consuming. The next big step was from rule-based to example-based MT, which meant that systems were given example translations, preferably by humans, that they can use to produce their own translations in what, um, in what we could call a recycling process. Statistical um, machine translation is basically a more elaborate way to do that, where the most likely translation is produced according to um, a corpus of translations. And today the dominating um, machine translation paradigm is neural machine translation, and that uses vast amounts of data in combination with machine learning in this case, machine, machines learn to translate themselves using artificial intelligence and large amounts of um, already existing uh, translations. So um, I would like now to move towards how machine translation or MT um, is a relevant subject also for translation studies. And for this, I would like to present this quote to you by the uh, by the renowned Irish translation studies scholar, Michael Cronin. And he said, students, scholars, and anyone, and indeed anyone interested in the future of human cultures and languages would be well advised to watch carefully what is happening to translation in the, in the digital age. So this quote keeps inspiring me to deal with translation technology and especially with machine translation from a translation studies point of view. This quote, um, this, uh, this quote points out that translation as an overall phenomenon is somehow an indicator of how language and culture develop in societies. So by taking a closer look on how we deal with translation, we might learn some things uh, also about our society in the digital era. And this is where machine translation becomes relevant, not only for computational linguistics, but also for 
uh, translation studies. So um, the success stories around machine translation um, also encouraged many translation studies scholars to deal with translation technology and especially uh, machine translation. Now research conducted on machine translation from a translation studies perspective, so not a technical perspective, can broadly be classified into these three levels. So on the first level, we, um, we have research that deals with translation processes and translator competencies. This includes translation as a human computer interaction, studies um, on translators as post editors, studies on the usability of computer aided translation tools or changing skill sets of translators in the digital age. Second, we have the level of uh, profession and market. Examples of research on this level include the effect of machine translation and on commissions and rates of professional translators, the overall status of professional translation in the digital age, or also the, uh, the value of translation in times where machine translation is only a click away. The third level rep represents the meta level in this categorization. On this level, we have theoretical discussions on the status of translation in a globalized and digitalized world, questions of ethics connected to MT, such as fair access to information and translation, or the proposal to even, to even develop a post-human theory of translation. The study that I will talk about in a minute um, uh, can be matched with this third level as it deals with translation concepts in, in machine translation research and development. So um, why, should, why should the understanding or the concept of translation in machine, transla in machine translation be interesting to us at all? Um, because it tells us something about the very core of this technology, about the purpose of this technology, and also about what happens to translation when it's a machine that translates. In search engines, for example, the keyword translator collocates with terms such as machine or automatic or free online. So by investigating the translation concept in MT research and development, we find out something also about the essence of this technological artifact. And also um, I'm trying to build a link for translation studies to investigate um, machine translation but based on its, on its own fears and own concepts, rather than focus on the technical functionality of MT. Um, yeah, so um, translation studies can look back on an ample um, discussion of translation concepts. So the translation concepts in, in translation studies are closely linked to the different turns this discipline took. So coming from a rather narrow understanding of translation by Otto Kade and the Leipzig School of Translation in the 1960s, the discipline went on to expand its notion of translation in the decades to come. So what you see here is a, a broad spectrum of translation concepts, ranging from recoding to deconstruction. So um, depending on what you think, uh, the process and the product, of translation should look like, you get different translation concepts. Translation can um, take something, can mean um, take something strange or foreign and make it your own, appropriating it, so to speak, in the case of cannibalism, for example, or rewriting something, which implies that something new comes to life. A translation uh, can be just an information offer that you can choose to use or not to use. A translation can also be seen as something that alters um, or changes the original to an extent where you could call it a manipulation even. Or taking the original apart piece by piece and deconstructing it in the process. So some translation concepts are more associated with cultural studies, some with literary studies, others with philosophy. Um, and what these examples show is that translation studies has a long history of dealing with the concept of translation. 
Um, translation studies is, of course, not the only discipline uh, that uses the term translation. Translation studies also does not have the monopoly on shaping the term translation. Translation is somewhat a traveling concept that is imported into different disciplines, then modified, and then maybe taken up by a different discipline again. Cultural studies um, is an example for a discipline that uses a very broad definition of translation. Translation is often used in cultural studies as a metaphor for any, any form of transformation or exchange. So it's a very, yeah, very, very broad understanding of tr what translation can mean. So you can say that cultural studies operate with a very broad translation concept, for example. Another discipline whose translation concept becomes more and more relevant um, is, of course, computational linguistics. So the understanding of translation in computational linguistics is, is likely to inform the development of machine translation systems. So translation concepts in computational linguistics are a key factor in shaping uh, MT as a technological artifact, which is why they seem worthwhile uh, in investigating. So um, this, uh, this research uh, actually takes place at the intersection of different fields. Translation concepts can function as a hub between various disciplines. Translation studies is the field that has already much experience with dealing um, in dealing with the concept of translation from different angles and looks back on a long history of describing what forms translation can take. Our machine translation research as a subfield of, of uh, computational linguistics is the area that is investigated in this case. And in order to investigate that object, I used theories and also methods from social studies, which I will elaborate um, on the following slides. Um, so now I'd like to introduce uh, a theory from, from science and technology studies. It's called social construction of technology or SCOT. And uh, it can, SCOT can deliver important additional um, aspects in the investigation of translation concepts in MT. Now, Wiebe Biker, one of the two protagonists behind Scott, next to Trevor Pinch, um, encapsulated Scott with the following quote, one should never take the meaning of a technical artifact or technological system as residing in the technology itself. Instead, one must study how technologies are shaped and acquire their meaning in the heterogeneity of social interactions. So um, technical artifacts don't, are not developed in a vacuum, but they're um, developed by human beings that have a certain idea in their, in their mind of what they, they uh, want to do with this artifact or with this technological um, tool. So, and um, from that quote, there are a couple of uh, questions raised also for the present case. For example, who are the driving social actors and also institutions behind MT development? And what interests do they have? What goals are they trying to achieve? Why is the technology working in the way it is working? What are the decisions that lead to a specific technical configuration? Um, in the study that I, that I conducted, I narrowed those questions down to what translation concepts MT researchers and developers operate with. Okay, um, so deal, dealing with translation concepts. In machine translation, I investigated the following questions. The first is, how is machine translation as a technological artifact subject to social um, construction? What are the determining factors in this process of social construction? Is it economic factors, policies, who are the key social players in this process? The second is what understanding of translation do um, MT researchers and developers have? Do they have a narrow or a wide translation concept? Do they have a common definition of translation or do they make it up in the process? What idea of translation quality 
uh, of translation quality do they have? The third is, is there a conceptual difference between human and machine translation according to MT developers? Do they even make that difference? Are they aware of any difference? What characteristics do they associate with machine translation and human translation? What are the respective advantages and disadvantages? So um, um, here is how I collected and analyzed the data to investigate these questions. First, it was essential to identify relevant social actors that have, that have great influence on machine translation as a technological artifact. In order to get hold of these relevant social groups, I, I visited places where they are supposedly found. So I visited university departments for informatics and computational linguistics in Europe, and also the Machine Translation Summit in Dublin in 2000, back in 2019, which is a global summit for MT development with people from academia as well as from the industry. I conducted 15 expert interviews with MT researchers and developers and analyzed them using a, a so-called structuring content analysis. Um, and now I would like to present some, some insights from this study and sh showcase some quotes from MT developers. First, let's take a look at how MT developers viewed or, um, how, um, how MT systems can be viewed as socially constructed uh, artifacts. So um, that's, uh, that's the first quote here. Um, by an MT developer. And they said, in academia, MT advances because of people's ideas. So there are people who are doing research and it's because they like this topic. It's a challenge for them. So they work on this. I'd say if you look in the industry, it's different. There is an economic opportunity. So whenever someone sees an economic opportunity, they try to make revenue, no matter the consequences. So this quote shows us two things. MT as a techno technology is shaped by social and economic factors. MT development does not happen in a vacuum, but it's driven by pe people's ideas, which is the essence of social construction of technology. So this MT developer, however, distinguished between MT development in academia and in industry and suggested that um, MT development in the industry is, of course, much more influenced by commercial interests. So this implies that MT might be shaped in such a way to make it more attractive to users and to sell that technology. And academia, on the other hand, there seems to be much less pressure to shape the technology in a specific way. So here's um, another quote. Um, uh, they said, in the industry, I see people that come from machine learning and are, that are machine learning experts. They may, they may not know anything about MT, they are very good at tuning algor algorithms. The machine learning, um, machine learning forms the core of neural machine translation. And this leads to the circumstance that people with no specific background in translation or even in machine translation shape uh, this technology. So you could say that MT is very much subjected to machine learning and what the people who are experts in this field and, and, to, um, and to the people um, who are experts in this field. Uh, this leaves less room for a comprehensive approach to machine translation. And the development is much is very much boiled down to the fate of machine learning. So let's now take a look at how the understanding of translation in MT research and development can look like. Here are some examples of translation concepts in, in MT. First, we have uh, examples of translation concepts that can be described as narrow. So the first one, translation in the context of natural language translation is definitely uh, information transfer from one language to another. And the second one, uh, there are different ways to encode information. I guess translation is required when I'm not using the same language, the same code that the person that I talk to uses. So first we have an exa um, example, we have, uh, or uh, in the first example, 
uh, translation is equated with information transfer. And the second translation is associated with encoding information. Um, this is um, both translation concepts actually resemble Claude Shannon's and Warren Weaver's model for information transfer. And these are these uh, were translation concepts that were very popular um, in the 60s when translation was still considered a subfield of, of linguistics, actually. So in translation studies, these would be uh, considered um, old translation concepts that we would not use the, these terms anymore to, to describe to describe translation. Okay, um, however, machine translation researchers and developers also seem to think beyond uh, the restraints of information transfer and recoding. So these two quotes are examples of broader concepts. Um, um, so, so for me, the process, or when it comes to translation, for me, it's the process in which you bring some message from a culture and language to make it understandable by people from another cult from another language that might have another culture as well. And in the second one, I think it's reinterpreting human thoughts between different systems of thoughts. You can say they're probably compatible, but not exactly matching one to one. Uh, so the MT developers also mentioned broader concepts such as interpretation or mediation between cultures. Uh, they talk uh, about culture and systems of thoughts. And this makes one wonder whether these concepts are compatible with machine translation. Or in other words, if machine translation developers talk about translation in these terms, how can machine translation live up to these concepts? So to, to, the, to this idea of, of translation. Um, so um, there, there seems to be a discrepancy between broad and narrow notions of translation in, in MT development. On the one hand, we have translation as information transfer and recoding. On the other hand, we have translation as interpretation and mediation. Even um, It even looks like the left column can be associated with the realm of machine translation and the right column fits more into what human translation can do. And it's hard to imagine how cultural mediation can be achieved by or via machine translation. I wanted to dig uh, a bit deeper here, which is why I also looked uh, closer into translation concepts that are associated uh, either, either with human or machine translation in the eyes of machine translation developers. So um, this is one example of how machine, a, a machine translation developer would describe the concept behind MT. And they said, I think we want to build systems capable of reproducing. We have our training data in the form of translations by human translators, a large number of them. And uh, we want to build a system which is capable of reproducing these human translations. Um, so what we have here is translation as reproduction. In the case of neural machine translation, so the current machine translation paradigm, translation is a big, is to a big part a question of using large amounts of data in the form of already existing translations to train these systems with. So everything that comes out of such a system is in its essence a reproduction of an already existing translation, most likely coming from a human. Okay. Um, here is another example of how um, an MT developer describes MT. So the basic difference between a machine and a human is that the machine has no understanding whatsoever of what uh, the words mean. And there is no model of the world, there is no knowledge. It is literally just looking at correlations 
between frequencies of lexical items and context. So it's very good at creating statistics about large amount of data about one word following another. Um, so um, this reads like a very critical description of machine translation, also pointing out the limitations of the technology. Um, the MT developer in this case also clearly distinguished between human and machine translation. So um, here I'd like to um, point out the right column first. So on the right column, uh, this uh, uh, here you see um, what um, MT developers associate with um, human translation. And they mentioned these four categories among others. So in a way they pointed out what we could call the added value of human translation. And they mentioned cater to customer needs, consider context and culture in, tar in the target language, text comprehension, world and uh, operating with the world model. Um, what is interesting is that MT researchers and developers seem to be very well aware of the limitations of machine translation. But so by associating these concepts with human translation, they are in a way suggesting also that MT is struggling with, with what is mentioned here on the, right, on the right side, in the right column. And when describing MT, the developers used uh, the concepts on the left that you can see on the left. Um, so as um, we put together these pieces, we come up with this comparison or confrontation between human translation and machine translation. And we see that there are different translation concepts behind uh, the two modes of these two modes of translation, um, according to MT developers. So um, this is actually already the, the last slide of my talk. So let me conclude. So in this presentation, we have seen how machine translation research and development shape MT as a, techno as a technology via um, their translation concepts. Like any other technology, MT development is determined by the notions, ideas, and also the goals of certain socially relevant groups that somehow have an impact on the technology. However, translation, um, however, trans uh, technology development can never be completely detached from the material world and from what is possible on a technological level. So. Um, even if you have, if you have very creative and and um, um, yeah ideas, you might not be able to put them into practice if the technology is not um, advanced as as much. So we see this when MT developers were asked to describe the translation concept behind MT, and when they mentioned reproduction, data processing, and calculation, because this is what the, the technology allows them to do, yeah? So uh, we can view uh, the, um, the ecosystem of machine translation development of kind of a, a reciprocal relationship between social and technological factors that influence uh, one another. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what we could call the ecosystem of, social, of the social and the technical <laughs> Um, in uh, in MT development, which yeah, I tried to illustrate here. So um, these are just the references that I used, and yeah, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to all the questions and comments that you might have. Thank you. <laughs>